Hello, my name is Chris Chappell, and I'm the Doshi Professor of Indic and Comparative Theology at Loyola Marymount University and Director of the Master of Arts and Overseer of the various Yoga Studies programs at our university. And I'm very delighted to be invited by Dr. Mondal and colleagues to return, at least virtually, to the wonderful Shantiniketan experience. And in the spirit of Shantiniketan, I sit here under the open sky to celebrate yoga, but also to talk about yoga in a time of anxiety, a time of the unknown in so many ways vis-a-vis -vis COVID-19. So I want to approach this through a sort of philosophical lens and draw from some of the many yoga-related schools that actually speak directly to the presence of disease. And first, I'll invoke a Jain word from antiquity called nagoda. And according to Jain philosophy, there are little microscopic particles, bacteria, and or viruses that are present in the air, present on every surface, ubiquitous in a sense. And each of these life presences or jivas that have taken the Nagoda form have the potential to be harmless, or in the case of disease, they cause great harm. And what the giants have done for centuries and centuries and centuries in order to protect the human from the potential of harm, but also very interestingly, in order to do no harm to these microscopic particles is that they have adopted the practice of wearing the mupiti. They have adopted the practice also of sweeping their path as they travel. And they have also adopted a vow, a religious vow called the Dirg Vrata. And in the Dirg Vrata, one takes a vow for a fixed period of time to restrict one's motion here and there, hither and yon. And the idea of the mask is to prevent inhaling such bacteria and viruses. And it's also to protect those viruses that are in the air from the too forceful exhale that can come with the voice. And perhaps even we know today, if one is diseased, could actually spread that disease to others. So the mask, as well as the filtering of water. And we know that seven layers of simple cloth, cloth made of cotton will actually filter water very effectively. And in Jain tradition, they would always filter water again to allow the bacteria to stay outside so it doesn't come into the body and expire within the human body or cause harm to the human body. And similarly, the idea with the brush is to just make sure the small broom or the brush is able to sweep away not only the visible insects, but also the buildup of these other life forms. And the idea is do no harm and let those beings do no harm to you. So that's a giant perspective on bacteria. And the notion of staying in one place is that you do no harm as you leave your house and no harm can befall you as you choose to stay in your house. Okay? So if you go out and about, all manner of things can happen. If you stay at home, you're more protected. And as our state of California 
locked down and we had this mantra, safer at home, safer at home, safer at home, I could not help but smile that we have self-imposed with government support, with the support of science, taken on these, at minimum, two giant vows of making sure that our mouths are covered and to make sure that we don't go all about like we normally would in order to place ourselves within safety. Now, other gods and goddesses get implicated with disease, Sitala, the god of smallpox, and the idea that by really being aware, perhaps even doing puja in order to ward off disease, or at least symbolically, and perhaps a little bit more power of energy of purification through the lighting of a, of a candle or the lighting of a deepa, that all of this is ways in which to become more mindful and ways in which we can find the sort of inner peace that is needed as we grapple with so much uncertainty. And as we think of all that's come out um, worldwide, every continent, every nation is attuned to the pandemic, which means this is affecting everything, that we find that these techniques and strategies are ubiquitous and the scientists proclaim that they are, that they are effective. And those states in America that went on shutdown early have had a better experience of making it through. There's so many different factors, but I wanted to start with a little bit of the science well known of disease and germs, of bacteria and viruses referred to as Nagoda in Jain tradition. I also want to turn our attention to the classical yoga of Patanjali. And in the first pada, he lists a whole range of obstacles that prevent the individual from moving into that sweet spot, that twin place of, of practice, abhyasa, and remove vairagya, so that the ideal for the yogi is to be able to abide in that yoga bhava, that yogic state of discernment, of becoming neither too excited nor depressed, the Bhagavad Gita. So beautifully says that the person who regards all beings with equal eye, that person is to be regarded as a yogi. And it involves this state of mind and this place within one's emotions called vairagya, where you are vi, vai, very strongly pulling back from raga, pulling back from all of the attractions and the allurement of the beauty that normally would propel us into action. So we have to abide, we have to hold back in order to cultivate that state of the drashtar, that state of being the witness, of being the observer, of being calm rather than being agitated. And in a long list that includes instability of mind, roughness of breath, simple, carelessness, along with this rather long disease of a uh, list of obstacles, we find vyadi delineated. And vyadi is disease. And it says that disease is an obstacle to yoga. And I want to tell a little bit of a story of the illness and of recovery. 
and one of the very first graduates of our MA in yoga studies, a very prominent teacher in Orange County, California, called Erica Burkhalter, contracted COVID-19 while traveling on her way back from the Caribbean. And in fact, both she and her husband contracted this disease. And she wrote of it so eloquently and talks about this is a very, very difficult, when you get full symptoms, you lose your appetite, you lose your ability to smell, your ability to taste. And she had unrelenting fever, even higher than a malarial fever, more than 104 degrees. And she was very close to that moment of really close to death. And thank goodness, following the protocols of keep the fluids, be calm, she and her husband both were able to recover. And both are long time practitioners of, of yoga sadhana. And I'm not saying that this saved them, but it did allow them to stay the course during this very, very difficult process of high fever and loss of appetite, of stomach upset, and then the return. And she said that as she became more well, that she just felt such a joy and appreciation for not only having survived, but of literally coming back into the realm of the beautiful. And I chose to bring this image today to remind us of the good life, to remind us as the practices of yoga remind us that we must content ourselves. We must learn to rejoice with the bare necessities of life. And as I introduced this concept of Nagoda and talked a little bit about the idea of nonviolence, our relationship with disease is in many ways inseparable from an awareness of our capacity to do no harm to the life around us. And we see in this beautiful image, a woman with a, with a vena playing so peacefully that the deer approach we can see the lotuses in the stream. We can see the beautiful trees in bloom. We get a sense of great quiet. And in order to land in that place of quiet, in order to land in that place of utterly being the observer, we must take up and live with the yamas and niyamas. We must keep that Gandhian attentiveness to figure out how to do no harm, ahimsa. And in the case of COVID-19, we must follow authority. We must apply that and commit ourselves to the sort of truth that will serve us well. And by that, I mean, we have to learn what is the nature of this virus. And thankfully it does look as if, because people do, require, re, people do recover from this, that it will be possible eventually to develop some sort of vaccine. Okay, that we need to take some comfort in that, not go into a state of great panic. And we must, follow what we know to be true. And that is that contact is 
airborne and that the closer that we are with other people, the greater likelihood emerges of the disease being shared. And then we go from Ahimsa Esteya, Ahimsa Satya to Esteya. And with Esteya, we have to remember that we don't want to steal safety from others. So therefore, like with this Zoom virtual presentation, very safe. If I were ill, I'm not anywhere near you. If you are ill, you're not anywhere near me. And we know as we go out and about, we'll need to have the mask. We need to take that two meter distance from all of the people. And that that is committing ourselves to a type of non-stealing. I don't want to steal your safety. And we need to abide in that place of brahmacharya, of being yet again a student, returning to sort of an innocence, like we normally can just go around thinking, we know what we need to do, but no, we have to become vigilant, we have to constantly be learners, and we have to comport ourselves with a sense of importance, both for protecting ourselves and protecting others. Now I'm gonna spend the last just few minutes talking a little bit about a parigraha. And a parigraha, a parigraha is restraint, ah, uh, from grasping, graha, all of the stuff that we normally would get out and grasp. And I just read a statistic today that the savings rate in the United States has gone up by 30% because people are not acquiring at the rate that they would normally acquire. That on the one hand, there's a little bit of a sadness because you know we aren't able to go freely shop. And I love going to the markets in India, sometimes just to look, but often like, wow, this is something that's really beautiful or necessary. But what's happened is that by people staying home, by people not entering the marketplace, they've come to more fully appreciate those items that are already here without adding more stuff in, there can be an acknowledgement that, as Gandhi would put it, or I'll paraphrase Gandhi, enough is enough. Most of us, at least in the households that we occupy, and I'm not saying this is true for all people, but most of us have enough clothing. Most of us have enough of what we need to simply get by. Not to diminish those many, many people who are coming up on food deficit, not to diminish the struggle of so many families that are now separated, so many people in India who have traveled back to village. But yet, as I've heard from uh, my Los Angeles friends of Indian origin who are in contact with their relatives, they're learning once more what it means to cook a meal. They're learning once more what it means to clean their own home. And there's a simplicity, there's a goodness, there's a sense of ownership not of the sense that, oh, I own this and these people do this for me, but there's a sense of swarupa. There's a sense of going back to the simplicity, really at the ground and at the core of yoga traditions, regardless of whether it's a Buddhist yoga or a Vaishnava yoga or a Shaivite yoga or a Jaina yoga or whatever it may be, that where does yoga bring us? Yoga brings us to that place of Viveka, 
brings us to that place of discernment that yes, all of this activity, as it says in the three gunas, happening, happening, happening. Yet, what needs really to be done? Yoga suggests we can cultivate patience, we can wait, we can observe. And when the moment for the return to the worldly activities as we once knew them presents itself, we'll be ready. But because of our long pause, we can re-enter with equipoise, we can re-enter with wisdom, and perhaps even more frequently, return again and again to this blessed place of silence. Thank you for your attention. <laughs>